Welcome to Manifold. Today, I am super excited to have Scott Aronson as my guest. Many of you will already know who he is, but let me introduce him as the David J. Bruton Jr. Centennial Professor of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin. Scott recently moved to Austin. Prior to that, he was a professor at MIT for many years. I believe, Scott, you and I have met physically in the real world, meet space world a few times, I think maybe at SciFu at the Googleplex. Oh, okay. And also, I definitely remember at one of the Microsoft Research Summer meetings, you and I uh, were both there and we took some cruise around the the Seattle uh, Bay or whatever it is. Uh, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, we've met before mm -hmm. and obviously I've been a long reader of your blog. So I'm super excited to have you here. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's great, great to be here. Great. So what I'd like to do is start with a little bit about your background, your education. I think you are famously, you were famously a very precocious kid. Just want to understand how you came to mathematics and then how you came to the particular research specialization that you've chosen. So maybe just tell us a little bit about your childhood. <laughs> okay. I liked math for as long as I can remember, really, you know, seeing how, how rapidly, you know, the, the powers of two increased, you know, with a calculator, you know, when I was four or five that I remember that. I mean, I remember it just completely rocking my world and you know, learning what, what negative numbers are. And then, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was a very big deal to get a scientific calculator that had these buttons like sin and cos that, you know, like, well, 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 what the hell are these, right? Well, what do these do? Right. And, you know, and then that was just a, a another mystery that, that, you know, one, one had to get to the bottom of, but I, I think that my, my goal for a while was, was actually to create my own video games. Like many, many kids, you know, in, in the, in the 1980s, you know, I got a, a Nintendo set and got obsessed with, with Nintendo, right? But what I, what I really wanted to was to create my own uh, video games. So I would just spend hours and hours just, you know, thinking about it, thinking about how I would design the game. Would it be a, a three-dimensional? What would the levels be like? Right? But I had no clue what it would take to actually bring any of it to life. I mean, that was just, you know, a, a complete black box for me. That was a mystery. You know, maybe, you know, you need a giant factory to uh, involve the components. Right. And, 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 you know, so I think that it, it was a, you know, a, a, one of the most revelatory moments in my life was, you know, this, this would have been when I was 11 and I was at a friend's house. He had, a, a just, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not even a Mac. I think, I think an Apple too. He said, you know, do you, do you want to try messing around with basic? And I said, what's basic? And he said, well, it's, it's a, it's a language, you know, you can, you can write programs with it, you know, like, so for, for example, you know, here's a, here's a game. It was, you know, the, some simple thing, you know, either pong or so, you know, a worm crawling around and, and growing right now, here's the code of the game <laughs> right now, you know, you can change this code here, you know, like right here and the game will do something different. Right. And, you know, I've said that, that for me, that was kind of like learning where babies come from, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the, the fact that, that, you know, you could take the, you know, the, the, uh, these whole worlds in, in miniature, you know, these, you know, video games and the creation of them is they're reducible to a math problem in some sense. It's just, you know, reducible to writing this code, right? Which is not just some kind of summary of the game, but is the game. And so then, you know, I had to learn what programming was, you know, I mean, I, I think my parents say that I, I had a, a tantrum, you know, I was, I was crying that, 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 that sort of, that, that they didn't tell me about this earlier, right. And that, that other kids might, you know, have a head start on me that I would never be able to make up at this point. Right. And I learned what I could about, about programming in the, in the next few years. But then, then at, at some point, I think I, I ran into a wall. And you know, you could say that, that that was about at the precise point where programming turns into software engineering, <laughs> right? So, you know, I, I love, you know, writing little programs for myself that would just test things like, you know, <laughs> for example, if you have um, a little worm that, that grows on the screen in random directions by taking a random walk, but it can't revisit any squares where it's been before. 
So it only, you know, picks a random square among the ones that it hasn't yet visited, right? Well, eventually it will get stuck. It will be, you know, surrounded on all sides by squares that it's visited. How long does it take until that happens? Hey, it turns out that it's about 70 steps, right? <laughs> and, you know, I remember just leaving my computer on all night, you know, to, to answer that question. I just spent years doing, doing that kind of thing. But then I, I then met other kids, you know, when I was 12, 13, I, I met another kid at my school who was actually writing shareware games, who was, uh, you know, putting them on, on America online where people could download them and play them. And that guy, he's, he's, he's be, he became a, a lifelong best friend of mine. He's now a, a well-known computer security researcher. His name is, is Alex Halterman, right? But, you know, maybe I didn't realize quite how extraordinary he was. You know, I, I thought, wow, other kids are just, are just such better programmers than I, than I am. Right. And in, in particular, you know, once I saw that to actually write significant software, right, it, <laughs> it involves documenting your code so other people can read it. It involves meeting deadlines. It involves getting your code to interoperate with everyone else's code. Right. And, and I realized that other people were just much, much better at that stuff than I was. Right. And if I had any comparative advantage, then, then, you know, maybe it was, it was more on the mathematical side. And so, so I think that, that that's probably what drew me more into the, the theoretical part of computer science. I mean, you know, when I was 13 or 14 or so, I would have been reading, you know, and just, just learning about what is, what is big O notation. How do you analyze algorithms, right? That there could be an obvious way to solve something, but that's not the best way, right? You can, you can be cleverer about how you organize information, you know, and, and then I would have learned about, about the, the P versus NP problem. You know, actually I, when I was, when I was 15, I went to a Canada, USA math camp in Seattle, which, which you know, blew my mind at the time, right? Cause you know, I mean, from, from being in, in, in high school to sort of being directly taught by, by these, you know, amazing mathematicians, right? Suddenly I was struggling to keep up. Right. And I was at best somewhere in the middle, but in, in particular, Richard Karp was there. Richard Karp was one of the, the founders of, you know, the theory of NP completeness. And he gave a series of lectures, you know, about, you know, how to prove things are NP complete about non-trivial efficient algorithms, you know, and that, that, that had a very big impact on me. And, you know, I probably had, had, a. a fantasies, uh, you know, when I was 15 that, well, you know, I was going to solve the P versus NP, problem, right. You know, and just, uh, you know, it m must be just some simple idea that, that everyone's been overlooking, you know, and, and I think, you know, it, it's, 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 it's important for, for someone learning a new subject to, uh, sort of go through that stage, you know, to be, to be burned by it, you know, as, as it were, right and emerge a little bit wiser. Someday some kid will foolishly think he can prove people's like, and dad should do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> let me let me just jump in for a second because I want yeah. to come back yeah. and talk about more about computational complexity and whether we be. But I just want to remark that, so this is, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about you that's fascinating. So you were already thinking about computational complexity. You even knew about big O, little O notation. And then you went to this math, math camp and then you met one of the leading people in the field. So that, that was extremely mm -hmm. fortuitous, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you went to college, you went to Cornell, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. Were you already? Yes. Okay. okay. So there's a weird story, right? I mean, when I was 13, I, I lived in Hong Kong for a year because my dad was working there and I went to an American, uh, international school and I, I had always been um, ahead in math or, you know, doing something special in math and this school couldn't accommodate it except by letting me skip to ninth grade. And so after a lot of discussion, they finally, you know, gave me permission to do that. And that was kind of like a dam breaking when like, I realized, wait, wait, you know, you could, you can do that. You can, you can, you, because, you know, I, um, I had been, you know, very unhappy in, in, in junior high school. I just, I, I, I felt like I, like I didn't belong and, and, and I felt like maybe if I can get to college, that will be in an, in an environment where I'm happier. And, and I think at that point, you know, my goal became to just sort of get to college as, as quickly as I could. And so we came back to the U S after that, and, and somehow I finagled my way into 
being in 10th grade, but, but 11th grade. And I took AP calculus at that point. And, you know, and then there were, there was no more math to take. And so my parents suggested that, well, why don't I just do multivariable calculus and differential equations as a self-study? And the school vetoed that. They said, you know, I'm not allowed to do that. And so then I, I sort of seized on that as my excuse to sort of get out of high school. And I found out uh, at this point about a program uh, at Clarkson University in upstate New York, uh, which is called the Clarkson School. This is a a program where where high school seniors can can live, you know, in in Potsdam, New York, at Clarkson University, and take college courses for the year. And I said I, I would like to do this. And because of the the math thing, I sort of had the had the pretext for being able to do it. And so so I went there and I had an amazing year. This this was the summer after the math camp, and I actually found a professor at Clarkson named named Chris Lynch, who I was able to work with. And at that time, the web was fairly new. I had an idea for how you could sort of optimize the design of a website with like you know a limited budget of of links. And so I wrote my first paper about it. That was this, this year that I spent at Clarkson. And from there, you could apply to colleges as a, as a freshman. I applied to all the, the, the usual places. I was, I was rejected almost everywhere I applied. I guess, you know, because my, my, my background was, was too bizarre at, at that point. But Cornell was, was nice enough to accept me. And so, so then that is, that is how I ended up going to Cornell. The year after that, uh, th that would have been when I was 16. There was one problem before I could start at Cornell, which was that, you know, they required a high school diploma and I, I, I did not have one. Sometimes one's old high school is sort of nice enough to give you a diploma after you go to Clarkson school. But uh, my high school said, well, no, I, I am missing phys ed. So I have to spend the whole <laughs> summer doing push-ups, basically, if I, if I want a, uh, a high school degree. So uh, instead of that, he said, well, what about getting a New York State GED? Okay. And so then you had to, you had to be 17 years old to get a, a GED, which I wasn't, but my, my, my mom spent hours on the phone with them and, and I got them to agree to give me a GED. So then, you know, that I, I, I actually, uh had that GED uh, hanging in my office when I was teaching at MIT for nine years. That was my... <laughs> <laughs> now, was, was the actual crucial event that you had to walk into some room at Cornell and show them your GED? I mean, is that how... Uh, no, 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 I, I, I don't think it was that dramatic. It was, uh, uh, it was, it was just something had to be mailed. I don't, th I think it was just becoming electronic at that point in time. We were still mailing things around. Right. But at this time, you, you sort of knew you were interested in theoretical computer science. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I was interested in, in theoretical computer science, but, you know, but I was also very interested in, in AI. And actually, uh, when I was at Cornell, it was really the AI people who I, who I ended up working with more, especially a professor at Cornell named, named, named Bart Selman, who's a leader in, in, in AI and in sort of us uh, uh, trying to solve NP complete problems in practice, you know, not just theoretically, right? Sort of in, in the empirical study of, of NP complete problems. And I became a sort of protege of his. And, you know, he was also the advisor to Cornell's RoboCup team. RoboCup is this uh, robot soccer league. And so I spent uh, a couple of years working on the, the AI programming for, for Cornell's uh, robot soccer team. In one sense, that was very successful. And, you know, we won the world championship for two years, but that was also, I think, a, a, um, an experience that, that, that clinched for me that I should not be a software engineer, right? <laughs> because just, you know, having to, to write all this code, meet all these deadlines, have all of these other people depend on me, right? It was just sort of nightmarish for me, right? They would, they would have some idea for how the goalie could work. And I would be like, well, you know, maybe, maybe we can prove that that's actually NP complete. <laughs> Let me spend a few weeks to think about that. And then, you know, maybe after a few weeks, Hey, I can prove it. And they're like, yeah, we don't care. We're doing it a completely different way now anyway. So th these were some of the experiences that, that, that sort of pushed me into theory. Right. But, you know, there, there remained the question, you know, as certainly at that point of, you know, can I do anything new? in theoretical computer science, because as I said, 
I thought about things, right? But, you know, let's say, but, but by this point, my ambitions had scaled back from, you know, solving the P versus NP problem, right? But, but even, even to do a, mo a much more modest thing, you know, again and again, I had the experience that, you know, you try to do something new and then, you know, either you fail or else you succeed. And then it turns out that it was already known. Uh, and so I, I really wasn't sure if I could do anything new in a, in a field like that. And then, you know, when it came time to apply to graduate school, it was, it was actually the AI people who took more interest in me than theoretical computer science people. So I did much better with graduate school than with undergraduate admissions, you know, and I had a lot of great choices and I, I ended up going to UC Berkeley for my PhD. Right, but it was it was actually a, a machine learning person, Mike Jordan, who was the one who recruited me there, and you know, and 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 at the time, I thought, well, maybe maybe I should do that. I mean, you know, machine learning seems like you know an up and coming field. Maybe that's going somewhere. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, this would have been in two thousand, and I, I spent a year doing that. But but at that point, I think mean, my heart was secretly in, in quantum computation. And that was really a thing that I was curious about. And maybe you know, the leading theoretical computer scientist working in quantum computing named Umesh Vazirani was there at Berkeley in the CS department. And, and my dream was really to work with him. And it took uh, a year for me to sort of work my way into his group, but that's where I ended up. And that was 21 years ago. And I guess I'm, I'm still here doing, doing quantum computation. Can I, can I ask you a little bit about that? So, um, you really? know, my, my familiarity with quantum computing is mainly from the theoretical physics side. Mm -hmm. And so to me, Vazirani is kind of a mysterious guy because yeah. he's from this different community, but uh, mm -hmm. has, you know, done important work. And so I was always curious, how did the theoretical computer science community first get interested in quantum computing, because I think probably some aspects of quantum mechanics must be very novel to them or unusual, yes. or, maybe, or maybe they just thought, okay, once you reduce it to a set of unitary operations, it, it, <laughs> it's sort of something we're used to. Yeah, uh, yeah no, it, it, it's, it, it's an excellent question. I think in the, in the eighties, quantum computing was, was not yet a field, right? It was an idea that a few physicists had explored, you know, famously Richard Feynman, and, and David Deutsch, and then, and they sort of realized that there was this theoretical computer science question here. You know, if you're trying to simulate a, a quantum mechanical system, then is there any way to sort of avoid this exponential explosion, you know, in the size of your state, you know, in the number of amplitudes, you know, that seems to be inherent when you, when you try to represent a quantum state with a classical computer. But that was only one thing of many that they were interested in at that time, right? I, I wouldn't say that they really focused in on it as, as, as the central issue. And only, you know, in the early 1990s, I think that a few computer scientists, you know, started getting interested. So Charlie Bennett was a very important figure here, right? So, uh, you know, Bennett was trained in physics and chemistry, but, you know, it was all, also did a lot of important work in computer science. Also, uh, Gilles Brassard, who was uh, Bennett's friend and then collaborator, you know, they invented the BB-84 quantum cryptography scheme together. So, you know, the, the, there was this small community uh, of, of people who were making these connections between physics and, and computation. So Umesh Vazirani, you know, has told me, you know, basically, you know, once he got tenure at, at Berkeley, you know, he was just looking around for something new and different to do. And, you know, he read Feynman's paper about, about quantum computation and he decided that, 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 that this was it, right? So he and his then student, Ethan Bernstein, wrote a now seminal paper in 1993, which was called Quantum Complexity Theory. And this was the first paper that really systematically studied quantum computing you know, from the standpoint of, of theoretical computer science. Okay. So what they did is they, they said, well, what is the right quantum mechanical generalization of the class P, right? P is polynomial time. It's the class of all the, uh, yes or no problems that are, that we think of as efficiently solvable by, you know, a Turing machine, by a conventional computer. So, you know, for example, you know, given 
given a, a graph, is it connected? You know, is, is every point reachable from every other? Or given an integer written in binary, is it prime? Okay, these are examples of problems in B. So Bernstein and Vazirani defined a class that they called BQP, bounded error quantum polynomial time, which was like a, a generalization of P, where now, you know, you're allowed to do unitary transformations. You know, you have qubits instead of bits, and you have to, uh, at the end, a measurement gets made of the quantum state. And this has to lead to your, you know, getting the right answer to your decision problem with a high probability. Okay. And, and again, we impose a requirement of efficiency. So, uh, the number of elementary operations, quantum gates, we would call them has to be bounded by some polynomial function of the size of the problem that you're trying to solve. And so, so they sort of, for the first time, they systematically studied, well, you know, what is this BQP? Is it at least, you know, as large as classical P? Okay, so they, you know, verified that, that yes, it is. Could it be just infinitely powerful, right? Could quantum computers let you solve, you know, the halting problem or, you know, uncomputable problems? Well, no, it doesn't go that far, right? So uh, uh, anything that's in quantum polynomial time uh, is also in classical exponential time. Okay, so, you know, and this is basically because you could, with a classical computer, you always can simulate quantum mechanics by just writing down the entire wave function, right? you know, the entire quantum state. Uh, but then, you know, they could, they could show something better than that. So anything that you can do in quantum polynomial time can also be done by a classical computer with polynomial space, with a polynomial amount of memory. And, and uh, for, for a physicist, I would say the reason for that is basically the Feynman path integral. Right. It's that you can take the probability uh, of that outcome that you care about and just represent it as a sum of exponentially many contributions that, uh, you know, could be, could be positive or negative. And, and then you can just, uh, evaluate that sum, you know, uh, needing exponential time, but, but reusing the same memory. And, and so then that, that already told you something very important. It said that in the present state of computer science. There is basically no hope of proving that BQP is larger than P, mm -hmm. right? Okay, right. So, you know, because I like, like the, the obvious question is, well, can a quantum computer do something efficiently that a classical computer cannot? Okay, but, but this said that, uh, well, sorry, if you want to prove that as a theorem, then you would also have to prove that P is not equal to P space because this BQP is sandwiched in between P and P space. Okay, but to prove P is not equal to P space is considered essentially as hard as proving P is not equal to NP. Okay, right. This is, the, you know, this is one of the, the great unsolved problems, right? So, so you know, uh, uh, quantum computing people have a good excuse mm -hmm. for our failure to solve this problem. It's not our fault, right? But now, you know, the, the, the next question that they, that they looked at was, uh, well, can we at least give some evidence that BQP is larger than P? And they gave what, what is known in the trade as Oracle evidence or black box evidence. Okay, they said, if you imagine that we had a certain black box that we can make queries to, you know, we can ask it questions, but we don't know its inner workings, then we can design a, a black box that, that would cause BQP to be larger than P. Okay. So this doesn't answer the question in the real world as it were, but it says that, you know, there is, there is some hypothetical black box that would, that would make quantum computing more powerful. And now it says, if you can just find a, a sort of real problem that instantiates that black box that gives rise to the same sort of behavior, then that would give you an example where quantum computing really was more powerful than classical computing. And so the, the bernstein Vazirani paper kind of, you know, set off this, this chain reaction of later, you know, uh, uh, of, of events over the next uh, year or two, where well, what happened was uh, first uh, someone named Dan Simon read their paper and said, well, you know, the, this, this, this doesn't sound right. You know, I, I don't think that quantum computers should really get such a, an interesting advantage and uh, try to prove you know, the, the sort of bernstein vazirani separation was, was limited and, and ended up proving the opposite. You know, ended up proving that actually, the, you know, a much better separation is possible. 
not just more than polynomial, but, but, uh, but uh, actually exponential. And uh, uh, for, for another black box problem, which was called Simon's problem. So Simon wrote a paper about that, submitted it to the, one of the premier conferences of theoretical computer science, and it was rejected. Okay, people just didn't know what to make of it. Uh, or they said, you know, maybe, you know, it, it involves this, this, uh, this fanciful black box, you know, like, you know, c come back to us when you can say something about the real world. Right. But, uh, there was one person on the program committee of that conference who said, no, I, I actually think this paper is interesting. And that person was Peter Shore. Okay. And, uh, what Peter Shore said was that, you know, you, you know, what, what Simon's quantum algorithm was doing is, you know, it's kind of like identifying a hidden periodic structure in a function. So like you're given a black box, it computes a function that has this sort of hidden global behavior to it, where a classical algorithm would need an exponential number of accesses to the black box until it had figured out the pattern, until it figured out this, this sort of global symmetry that the, that the function has. But he showed that if you could evaluate all possible inputs to this function in quantum superposition, then you can sort of arrange a pattern of interference that reveals the answer in only a polynomial amount of time. And then Shore said our cryptography, you know, that we uh, protect internet commerce by, you know, and then the, that itself was just really starting at that time. This was uh, 1994, right? But, you know, RSA and Diffie-Hellman, right, are our forms of encryption are also based on functions that have sort of hidden periodic structures. What if you could just change Simon's problem around a little bit in order to uh, find the, the periods of, of those functions, you know, of integer functions? Wouldn't that then let you uh, factor numbers efficiently and calculate discrete logarithms efficiently, things like that? So that turned out to be technically much more involved than what Simon had done. And sure, had to work on that for a year, but but he eventually found that it was possible, and that that's what we now know as Shor's algorithm in 1994. Uh, you know, now Shor was a uh, mathematician, but one who had also studied physics. You know, I should say that Vazirani was a computer scientist, but who had also studied physics, right? So they had kind of the right combination of training to be able to make these connections. And once Shore announced his factoring algorithm, that was when the floodgates opened. And you know, I think people realized that, you know, quantum computing was going to be a thing. It was not going away. And, you know, immediately they started trying to figure out two more things, which, which 28 years later are still at, at the center of our interest. And the first thing was, well, well, what else is a quantum computer good for, right? Supposing that you have one. Supposing that it works perfectly, you know, what else can it do besides factoring numbers or these few other very special problems, right? What about for NP complete problems? You know, how much of an advantage does a quantum computer give you there, right? Even if P is not equal to NP, you know, is it possible that, 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 that quantum mechanics makes a difference there? Okay. We're still stuck. We're still, uh, studying that question, you know, a uh, decades later. Uh, and then the second, maybe even more obvious question is, well, how do you actually build a quantum computer? How do you take this theory and, and how do you turn it into engineering? And that led to another great development in the 1990s, which was the theory of quantum error correction, quantum fault tolerance, which said, you know, how can you make this work? Not with ideal perfect qubits, but even with, with noisy qubits, you know, which is, which is what you have in the real world. People had amazing theoretical ideas, uh, about that in the, in the, in the nineties, including Peter Shore himself, by the way, and decades later, you know, they are finally starting to turn those ideas into reality, uh, just about now. So, you know, so, so, so all, all of this was happening in like 1994, 95, when I would have been 13 or 14 years old, <laughs> uh, I was, I was not, you know, uh, aware of it, uh, at the time, but then, uh, I would say around, well, around 95, uh, so maybe a year or two after it had all happened, I read a popular article about it, uh, you know, about Shor's algorithm and, and so forth. And my first reaction when, when I learned about it was, you know, this sounds like obvious garbage, 
<laughs> this sounds like some physicists who just sort of stumbled into computer science and you know think that they can solve exponentially hard problems and just do not understand the enormity of what they are up against right and you know and and, and i should say you know th th this skeptical reaction you know was shared by many computer scientists there are some who still have that reaction right who haven't who haven't gotten over that reaction and and you know it it, it is an attitude that, that actually has a lot of support in in the history of computing right again and again people have tried to uh design architectures analog computing for example you know that would get around the limitations of the turing machine and and again and again they failed right because uh they were always ignoring some resource that would actually blow up exponentially such as the energy that you would need or the precision that you would need in measurement okay and so you know you could say a natural first guess would be that quantum computing would just be another example of the same thing where you know, people are just sort of ignoring some resource that will blow up on you and become exponential when you try to actually build uh, one of these quantum computers. But but then, you know, I sort of had no choice but to learn more about, it, right? Because, you know, like I, I didn't think of myself as a, you know, a physicist at all, right? I'm a math computer science person, but it's like now physics is impinging on our world. Right. It is making this, you know, enormous claim about, you know, the world of P and NP that, you know, I have to see if it's true. So I, when I was at Cornell, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to do a, a couple of summer internships at, at Bell Labs. You know, this was when Bell Labs was still a, uh, <laughs> I guess, a, a you meet you know, Grover when you were at Bell Labs. I did. I did. So, yeah. So first I uh, worked with someone named Eric Gross, just on some st statistical software. You know, it had nothing to do with quantum computing, but I got really curious just, you know, reading about Shor's and Grover's algorithms, how they were, you know, and, 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 you know, there, there were already web pages about it. You know, the web itself was only uh, five or six years old. I, I, I read about the, the, the these quantum algorithms and, you know, and I, I was, I was blown away by uh, uh, a couple of things. First of all, that I could actually understand this, right? I would have imagined that. Well, I would have had to study, you know, physics for years and years before I could even begin to understand what, what they were talking about. But then when you actually go and read the papers, uh, it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's just your state is this unit vector of complex numbers. You know, you, the way that you act on it is by unitary matrices, just like you were saying before, Steve, right? Uh, it's, you know, uh, it, it's kind of like a classical probabilistic computer except that instead of probabilities, which are real numbers between zero and one, now we have these complex numbers, uh, which are called amplitudes. So, okay, you know, that, that, that's very interesting. I think even if our universe had been classical, you know, someday some computer scientist could have defined BQP, right? mm -hmm. just, yep. for, just for purely theoretical interest. And, you know, it would have been an interesting thing to study, right? You know, of course, you know, the fact that our universe really does run on these amplitudes that does heighten the interest of this you know to uh to put it mildly okay but th this was really just linear algebra right and you know I, I knew linear algebra right and you know i didn't I, at that point i didn't know what a boson was what a fermion was what a hamiltonian was right a uh, creation operator you know and, and i didn't need to know any of that right i could you know learn all the details of how the quantum algorithms work you know, just by uh, learning the, these rules, these abstract rules of unitary evolution and, and measurement. You know, it's very similar to how, you know, you could learn uh, all about programming, become a virtuoso computer scientist without needing to know uh, how a transistor works or, you know, or in principle, even, even that there is such a thing as a transistor, right? Yeah. You know, it's all been abstracted away for you. And I saw that something similar was true in quantum computing. And so, so I learned about it and, and my boss, Eric was kind enough to say, well, why don't you just spend a few weeks just learning this subject? And so I, I, I did, and I even managed to prove some, you know, I was very excited to prove some new results, but then, you know, it, it turned out that those results were already known. Okay. But you know, it, it wasn't that like I was reproving stuff that was like 50 years old. 
It was that I was reproving stuff that was one year old. Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, like someone had beaten me to it by, by one year, right? And, and, and then I found out that Lava Grover worked in the same building at, at Bell Labs as I did, right? And now Grover was the uh, discoverer just, you know, a couple of years before of Grover's algorithm which is maybe, you know, the, the second most famous quantum algorithm after Shor's factoring algorithm. Okay. So compared to Shor's algorithm, you know, Grover's algorithm has an enormously greater range of application. You know, it works for NP complete problems. You know, it works for pretty much any combinatorial search or optimization problem. You know, that you could think of, it's been generalized to other stuff like playing game, you know, games like chess or go. Monte Carlo estimation, uh, machine learning problems. But the disadvantage is that the speed up from Grover's algorithm is not exponential, right? It is quote unquote only quadratic. So like where a classical computer would need n time, Grover's algorithm needs the square root of n time. Can I ask you about that? So, so in, in the case of Grover, we, we know very well that it's, you know, n goes to square root of n speed up. In the case of discrete logs and factoring, do we really actually know what the optimal classical performance would be on those problems? Because, well, no, absolutely not. This comes right back to, you know, these, these central mysteries of, of theoretical computer science that we were talking about before, like the P versus NP problem, right? If P were equal to NP, then among many other things, it would mean that there was a fast classical algorithm for factoring numbers. And it would mean that Shor's algorithm does not achieve an exponential speed, right? So, but even sorry to interrupt, but even if even if p is not np, mm -hmm. isn't it true that the the exact polynomial scaling of the mm -hmm. difficulty of factoring is not really known? Is that true? That is also true. Yeah, that is true as well. Yeah. So so factoring seems to inhabit like a a, a twilight zone between P and the NP complete problems, right? We, we do not think that factoring is, is NP complete. We have, you know, excellent theoretical reasons why it shouldn't be. But then on the other hand, we also don't have a fast classical algorithm for it. Okay. So it seems to have a lot of special structure and that special structure was enough for sure to design a quantum algorithm to solve it. Uh, what we don't know is whether it's also enough to design a fast classical algorithm. Right. You know, now that there are classical algorithms for factoring that, that do better than, than pure brute force. Okay. The most famous of these is called, uh, the number field sieve. Okay. So it, it lets you factor an N digit number in time that is instead of exponential in N, uh, it's roughly exponential in the cube root of it. Right. This is using elliptic curves, you know, but this is, this is how, you know, presumably, uh, you know, the NSA or the GCHQ. Right. When they are attacking people's cryptography, they're presumably using algorithms like these. And there's some evidence, you know, from the uh, Snowden, Edward Snowden uh, documents in, you know, 2014, that at least at the time they were, they were doing something like that. But you put your finger on, you know, one of the central difficulties of this field, which is that, you know, we don't know in present how to prove inherent limitations uh, of algorithms in, in most of the cases that we care about. So we can say, you know, there is an algorithm to do such and such, but, you know, is, is it optimal? You know, we don't know. People still wonder, well, you know, how great of a speed up can quantum computers give for solving NP complete problems? Now, what we know is that there's this thing that I was talking about before called the black box setting. The black box setting is where you sort of abstract away all the details of the problem. So you could say, you know, imagine that we just have this abstract function that lets you search in a haystack, you know, you tell it where you're searching and then it tells you if you have found the needle in the haystack or not. Right. And then in that setting, we know that Grover's algorithm is the best that even a quantum computer can do. Okay. And so that, that's a very important theorem that was proven by Bennett, Bernstein, Brassard, and Vazirani in uh, 1994, it's called the BBBV theorem. And ironically, this was proven before Grover's algorithm was even discovered. Okay. So, uh, Grover's algorithm was proved to be optimal in the black box setting before it was even discovered to exist. And I think at the time they said, well, we can only prove that square root of N 
steps are, are needed. And presumably that's just some technical defect in the proof. Mm. And then Grover came along a year later and said, no, it's not a technical defect. You know, that's because, you know, there is a, uh, as we would say, a matching upper bound, right? A quantum computer really can solve these, you know, this, this abstract search problem in, in square root of n time. Now, the trouble is uh, that still doesn't answer what you might really want to know in practice, which is, well, well, let's say you, you have the traveling salesman problem, right? Or you have satisfying a bunch of constraints or some, you know, model checking for some, you know, a microchip design or some machine learning problem, or you're trying to break some, some cryptographic code, or you're trying to mine new bitcoins or something like that, right? These are all problems that are, are not just purely abstract search problems. Right. They have more structure to them. And so then the question remains, well, could a quantum computer exploit that structure to do better? This we don't know. In formal terms, this is the question of is NP, which is the class of all the problems where a classical computer can at least verify the answer efficiently when given it, is NP contained in DQP? Can NP complete problems be solved in polynomial time? Then, you know, maybe not surprisingly, we don't know the answer to that, you know, because we don't even know whether NP is contained in P, mm -hmm. right? But we know that uh, if, if there is a fast quantum algorithm for NP complete problems, then it has to look very, very different from any of the quantum algorithms that we currently know. It has to look very different from Grover's algorithm, which only gives you this square root speed up it also has to look very different from Shor's algorithm, which requires this very special structure, this periodicity structure, which the NP complete problems don't seem to have. So, you know, there's now been like almost 25 years of, of efforts to, uh, you know, work on that problem often by designing heuristics. So, uh, people have studied, uh, oh, what about annealing processes, right? There's something called the adiabatic algorithm. And these are kind of like, uh, you take classical heuristic methods, uh, that are, uh, like simulated annealing, uh, which, which are, you know, which are not guaranteed to work. They can take exponential time, but often enough, they, they, uh, give you a good solution in practice and you can sort of make them quantum, right? You can, uh, try to take advantage also of quantum tunneling effects. Uh, to sort of get out of local optima and get to the global optima. I mean, this is exactly what uh, people study with the quantum, this quantum adiabatic algorithm. Okay. But after more than 20 years of research on it, you know, we still don't really know sort of, is there some subset of optimization problems that, that, that matters in practice where, you know, this will give you an exponential speed up over classical algorithms. We know that you can. In this black box scenario, we now know as of the, the last year or two, thanks to a breakthrough by Matt Hastings and subsequent work by, by Umesh Vazirani and uh, Andres Gillian, we know that you can construct uh, solution landscapes where uh, any classical algorithm needs exponential time, but this sort of quantum annealing approach will reach a global optimum in polynomial time. So that that's possible, but then are these landscapes ever relevant? You know, do they ever arise in any practical optimization problem that we still don't know? Okay. So, you know, so there, there's plenty on, on our plates, you know, even just on the theoretical side of quantum computing, e even today. Right. And this, this is one of the examples. I think that was a great introduction to you know, an area for people like me who, you know, if you come from the physics side and you, you read some textbook on quantum computing, all the computational complexity stuff is in some kind of overview chapter at the beginning. And yeah, start, right, right. I mean, I mean yeah, exactly, right? It, it kind of gets... Well, you, you see some Venn diagram with BQP. Yeah, and yeah right. It, it, all, it all gets shunted off to the side. Yeah, you got to, Steve, you got to look at the Bernstein Vazirani paper. Yeah. I think I did look at it in the 90s without without, under, without understanding it at all, right? So. It, it does do everything. And from today's standpoint, is like a ridiculously unwieldy way, right? Like, you know, we could say everything much simpler today. So maybe look at my lecture notes. Look at my, you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, you know, I was about to say, you know, I, I ended up working, you know, I, I mean, I, I met Grover. You know, I, I told him my ideas for Grover's algorithm, you know, and how to improve it, which were complete nonsense, right? Which just didn't work at all. But Grover was kind enough to offer me an internship with him the following summer at Bell Labs. And 
So I did that and I, I met some of Vazirani's students from Berkeley were also working with Grover. So I, I met them and I learned actually what was, you know, the state of the art in, in quantum algorithms research. And that's when I sort of formed the intention, like I have to go to Berkeley, I have to learn whatever it is that these people know. And so that, that was really how I got started in quantum computing research was really, you know, that, that summer at Bell Labs. After all that, it's, it's, after all that, it's kind of amazing that you spent that year with uh, Michael Jordan in, uh, in ML. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I had an idea at the time, that maybe I'm going to combine quantum computing with machine learning, you know, and right. come no one's talking about that. Right. Yeah. But at the time that no one was talking about it, you know, so I, I needn't have worried. Right. Like if I just gave it another 10 or 15 years, that would become like, you know, the most hype thing in the history of hype, right? <laughs> and, you know, which is, which is what it is now. Yeah. It's like hype squared. And then if you can add crypto into it, you're done. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, I was, I was thinking about that even in, uh, at 2000, you know, but then, um, you know, decided, well, 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 yeah, I can, I can invent quantum versions of all these machine learning concepts like graphical models and so on. But then what do you do next? Right. We, why is this useful? You know, how do you show that there is an advantage compared to the classical versions of these things? And since I couldn't answer those questions, I sort of set it to the side. Now, you know, if I had only known from today's perspective, right, you know, I would have known that, that none of that is any barrier at all. You just write hundreds of papers about it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But at the, I, I'm a little worried that we might've lost some of uh, the listeners who are not so theoretical in their right. orientation. So maybe we can switch to a more concrete topic, or at least one that's in the news, which is quantum supremacy. Okay. So maybe we can explain, because I, I'm sure people see these uh, headlines all the time, right? On the uh -huh. internet that, yeah. oh, they've got this com quantum computer now, which is, you know, better than any classical computer, computer we can possibly imagine. Yeah. Maybe you could just say what you think about quantum supremacy and what's a useful way to think about it. Yeah, sure. So the term quantum supremacy was coined uh, by, by John Preskill uh, a decade ago, although it referred to something that, 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 that some of us had been, had been thinking about for, for several years by that time. And it's basically just how do you use a quantum computer to do something that is that we're as confident as possible is hard to simulate with a classical computer. And now uh, it is crucial that, you know, I did not say something useful. Okay. You know, just, to, it could be some completely artificial benchmark, but you know, our goal is just to sort of prove the quantum computing skeptics wrong. Kind of like, you know, the, uh, the Wright brothers airplane was not, you know, useful for commercial air travel, right? It existed just to prove a point. So around 2010, 2011, some of us started thinking about, well, how do you use a quantum computer, you know, which, which might not be ideal, you know, not quite what we want. So it doesn't have thousands of perfect qubits. Maybe it only has 100 noisy qubits, right? But, uh, can we still use it to do something that would sort of demonstrate the reality of exponential speed ups by means of quantum computation. We realized that there are a lot of advantages to switching attention from problems like factoring that have just a single right answer to what are called sampling problems. Hey, a sampling problem uh, says, you know, I'm going to describe to you some probability distribution over some huge number of possible outputs. And now you just have to sample a random output, but consistently with that distribution. So the pattern of which outputs are, are likelier or unlikelier, you know, should, should, should match this distribution. So around 2011, my then student, uh, Alex Arkhipov and I came up with one of the first proposals for how to do this, uh, which we called boson sampling. At this point, I did have to learn a little bit more physics. I did have to learn at least what bosons were. Although at, at that time, it was still for just a, a sort of a theoretical computer science reason. We wanted a quantum computer to sample from some distribution uh, in which the probabilities were given by very, very hard functions for a classical computer to keep track of. And uh, we focused on a particular hard function which is called the permanent of a matrix. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, so a lot is known about the permanent 
from you know the standpoint of uh, computational complexity uh, that it, it's something called sharp p complete, which we think is even harder than NP complete. And so we thought that it had the right properties for creating one of these hard sampling problems. But then we, we needed to know what kind of quantum computation would give rise to permanence uh, as the amplitudes. And the answer turned out to be uh, a quantum computation based on bosons, based on generating a bunch of, you know, identical bosons, such as photons, for example and then sending them through a network of beam splitters, for example. And then you would have to sum over sort of all possible ways of permuting these identical particles around, you know, when each way of permuting them would uh, make another contribution to, to the amplitude and you'd, you'd get a permanent. I had known that that connection existed for a long time, but I never really knew what to do with it. And so we decided, well, could you use this to just create some very, very rudimentary quantum computation, but that nevertheless, we can give evidence is hard to simulate with a classical computer. So that's, that's what we did. We, we published about that in, in 2011. And then what, what happened? And I should say other people, uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard came to very similar ideas, but not from bosons, from, from different starting points. And then the experimentalists around that time uh, got all excited. Right. Because they said, well, you know, guess what? These bosons are not just a theoretical construct. We have photon sources in our labs, right? You know, we do stuff like this all the time, right? We send photons through networks of beam splitters. We uh, send them into photo detectors and, and we measure where they landed. Maybe we could actually do this. And, uh, and that was really a new thing in my career because I had been about as far as you could get on the theoretical end of quantum computing research for a decade. Occasionally, like I would be let into a lab for, for a lab tour, you know, if I promise not to touch anything, right. But it's like, you know, I didn't know, like they could have told me that their, that their coffee machine was the dilution fridge and I probably would have believed them. Okay. But once the uh, quantum optics people started getting, getting interested in boson sampling, then we realized, you know, wow, we are actually going to be collaborating or, you know, working with experimentalists now to try to make this a reality. Uh, and so then Preskill wrote this paper where he gave the name quantum supremacy to sort of this quest to sort of, you know, demonstrate a quantum speed up for something, you know, it doesn't have to be something useful. And then, and then, and then there was a backlash. Not everyone liked that name, you know, and so today people are calling it quantum advantage. Uh, oh, yeah, it's not, it's not politically correct supremacy. Exactly. But, uh, can I just, can I, can I just ask though, is the, is the definition of it, it's, do you allow the classical computer to work for the age of the universe or what, what is the actual, at what point do you actually state? To my mind, you know, the definition is, you know, you want a well-defined task. So you, you can specify in advance, you know, what the inputs and outputs are. Right. And, and so I want to rule out, you know, you say simulate this system, right? That's not a precise enough definition of a task, right? You know, I want a, a mathematical specification of what is to be done such that it would make sense to say, did the quantum computer fail to do that task? You know, I mean, I mean, no, no, mm -hmm. no machine ever fails at the task of simulating itself, right? But a, a, a device could fail at the task of boson sampling you know, from a certain distribution. So now what we say is that the, the quantum computer should be able to do this task in a you know, reasonable amount of time. We should be able to verify that it really did do the task, but you know, with a classical computer, it, it should take us orders of magnitude longer to do the same task. And, and it has to be a competitive process, right? The classical skeptics need to know all the specs of, you know, what they would have to do to match this. And they have to have worked on it for at least, you know, a year or two, put a real effort into it and just not be able to come within several orders of magnitude of, of matching the performance. So, you know, there are still many details that you can quibble with. And actually yeah. the people have been quibbling about over the last few years, right? What exactly counts as quantum supremacy? Uh, you know, how exactly do you measure resources, right? What if a quantum computer can do something and then you can match its performance using, you know, an enormous network of, you know, thousands of cores with a classical computer? Yeah. Do you say that a quantum advantage remains? 
You would like to say maybe, yes, it does. You could say, even when there's not a quantum advantage in time, maybe there's a quantum advantage in carbon footprint. Right. You know, <laughs> right. You know, you're, you're using massively more energy to run this, this classical simulation than you are to run the quantum computer itself, even though the quantum computer needs a dilution refrigerator. So, you know, so it's not exactly a, a energy friendly thing itself. Now you could say, ideally what you would want is like a, a much, much larger separation. You'd like something that a quantum computer can do in, in a few minutes. And that, you know, with the largest classical computers on earth would take millions of years or billions of years, right? And, and we hope that eventually Shor's algorithm will, will get us to that point, you know, of doing that kind of demonstration. But with the, with the existing quantum supremacy experiments, there's a difficulty, which, which fundamentally prevents us from showing a, a separation that's that large. And the difficulty is, well, we still need a classical computer to verify the answer, mm -hmm. right? We need to prove that the quantum computer did what it's supposed to do. And with boson sampling or with, with that style of quantum supremacy experiments, no one has discovered how to verify the answer with a classical computer, except by doing this exponentially hard computation. Okay. So what that means is that you can do a demonstration with 50 qubits or 60 qubits. And then that's exactly what Google did a couple of years ago, a group at, at USTC in China did just uh, within the last year. And then you can actually verify the results, you know, using, let's say a, a, a classical supercomputer, right? And it might take a week or a month, but you can do it. But you know, th this inherently doesn't scale even to a hundred qubits because, you know, you can do uh, a two to the 50th power is within what you can do with the biggest classical computers on earth, two to the hundred power is not. So really, you know, new ideas are needed, right? I mean. The wonderful thing about factoring, you know, the problem solved by Shor's algorithm mm -hmm. is that it is easy to check the answer, right? Once, you know, some machine has found the prime factors of some not, you know, thousand digit number, well then, you know, you just, if you don't believe it, you just multiply those factors yourself. You just check. Uh, the uh, trouble is that to implement Shor's algorithm, you know, that seems to require an error corrected quantum computer. It seems to require something that we don't yet have to do this error correction. You seem to need thousands of physical qubits to encode just a single logical qubit. Okay. So at that point you would be talking about millions or hundreds of millions of physical qubits and those of a higher quality than what we have today. There are now lots of companies that are sort of racing to try to achieve that, you know, within the coming decades. And maybe they will, but that's not something that we have yet. Okay. And so quantum supremacy, you know, what, what got people excited was that maybe you can demonstrate a quantum speed up, even with a noisy device that is not error corrected. That's exactly what Google and, and USTC, you know, have, have done or claimed to do or tried to do within the last couple of years. And it looks like a, a, a pretty clear quantum advantage remains in these experiments. But it is not as, as decisive as we would like, mainly because of this reason that I mentioned, the difficulty of classical verification, right? Which sort of puts a limit on sort of how far you can scale this stuff. So I think one of the great challenges for just the next five years is, can we figure out a way to demonstrate quantum supremacy on a near-term quantum computer? So, you know, noisy quantum computers with little or no error correction which is the kind of stuff that we've, we've got now, but where a classical computer can easily recognize the, a right answer, right? Where you can easily verify it classically. And now for, for bonus points, you could try to do that also for a problem that is actually useful, right? That someone actually independently cares about. Okay. But I'm not even going to demand that part. So just to make sure I understand. So the, the verification is a problem because it can be extremely hard for the classical computer, but in deciding that on this particular problem, it's a well-posed quantum advantage. You do have a rigorous limit on the best algorithm for the classical computer to generate the distribution in the first place. Ah, okay. So, so th th that's another very good question. So yet again, it's going to depend on some unproved conjectures. Al almost every 
hardness statement that, that you can ever care about in theoretical computer science, you know, depends on some unproved conjecture. I hate to break this. But is, you, it, is right? it a conjecture as that people are as confident in as say yeah. P not equal NP? That's an excellent question. Now, what, what got us excited about boson sampling a decade ago was, was precisely that, that we were able to prove a theorem that says that if you had a fast classical algorithm that could sample from, you know, exactly the same distribution that a, uh, say, say an ideal version of this experiment, you know, a noiseless version of this experiment would sample from, then that would have really dramatic consequences for classical complexity classes. I wouldn't quite mean P equal NP, but it would mean that the polynomial hierarchy would collapse, which is something that, that complexity theorists tend to think would be sort of almost as shocking as P equaling NP. Okay. Okay. But you're pretty so, so we, we were able to relate the hardness of boson sampling for a classical computer to the non-collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. And Bremner, Joza, and Shepard reached reach similar conclusions about their model. Okay, and so, so that, that got people excited. Now, unfortunately, it still doesn't quite answer maybe the physically relevant question because the problem is that in any real experiment has lots of noise in it. In fact, with these real experiments, when you make the measurement, you see about 99.8% noise and you're just trying to extract, you know, that tiny 0.2% of signal by repeating the um, sampling process uh, several million times. That's what Google did. That's what USTC did. And so then that forces us to ask a new question, which is, well, what about the noisy version of the experiment. Is that also hard for a classical computer to simulate? And, and that we, we have not been able to uh, relate to the non-collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. That remains one of the great theoretical open questions in this area, right? Uh, so, you know, our Arkhipov and I, you know, worked on it for, for half a year. We gave some evidence that sort of even the noisy version of boson sampling, you know, we thought uh, should be classically hard. Okay, but that, that remains a, an open question to give evidence for the hardness, you know, that is at the same level of, as what we know for the exact case of, of, of the problem. And then this is actually a very common pattern in uh, theoretical computer science. So for example, in, in cryptography, often people will design some crypto, some, some cryptographic code and they will prove a theorem that says, well, if you could break this protocol, this system then you have to be able to, you know, invert any one-way function or sort of do something that would seem almost as dramatic as P equaling NP. And this is, this is kind of the, the gold standard in our present state of knowledge, right? This is the kind of reduction argument that you want, right? I think theoretical computer science, you know, to a large extent is about passing the blame to someone else, right? It's saying, you know, if, if my cryptographic protocol is broken, well, then it wasn't my fault. Right. It's because these one way functions were actually not one way functions or something like that. Okay. But then the trouble is when, when things actually get implemented in real life, then people always take shortcuts, but right. They always do things in the implementation, you know, that sort of cut corners and then make it not exactly match the theoretical specification. Right. And then, you know, a lot of practical security research is just all about that gap. It's not about sort of breaking down the, uh, the front door, you know, breaking the underlying cryptographic code. It's about finding some side doors, right. Uh, uh where, where just the, the, uh, the implementation doesn't match the spec. And so we've seen exactly that same kind of dynamic play out with the quantum supremacy experiments, right. Where, you know, in order to implement these experiments over the last few years, people have sort of cut corners as it were. So they said, well, we don't have uh, initial states that are just single photons, you know, the way that Aronson and Arkhipov wanted, right? We have what are called Gaussian states instead, right? We have, you know, some percentage of the photons get lost on the way through the beam splitter network, right? Not all of the photons are detected at the other end. Okay. But, you know, we think maybe it's still okay. Right. You know, or, you know, at least we, we still can't think of a fast way to simulate this with a classical computer. Okay. But then someone else comes along and says, aha, by using these imperfections in the real experiment, we can design a much faster way to simulate this with a classical computer. 
Okay. And then the experimentalists go back and say, okay, but we can improve the experiment in order to rule out your attack. And then some, some other classical people come, come along and say, ah, but we have a different attack. So then, you know, that, that, that is basically the dynamic that we, we've been seeing over the last couple of years. Yeah, I worry a related concern I've always had about error correction is that I think they use a fairly benign model of the noise that they're fighting. And I think they assume it's, you know, pretty much uncorrelated noise that they have to beat down with their error correction. And it could be in, in particular experimental setups, certainly that the situation is much worse than. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's absolutely true. And that was recognized as an issue, I would say, you know, from the very beginning. Once people proved these theorems in the 90s, you know, about the, the possibility of uh, quantum error correction, quantum fault tolerance, the skeptics of quantum computing knew if they want to say that this is fundamentally impossible, as opposed to merely hard, then either they're going to be denying quantum mechanics itself, or else they're going to be denying one or more of the assumptions that go into this quantum fault tolerance. So many of them have been doing the latter. You know, they've been saying, well, what if the noise is correlated? What if it's sort of just conspiratorially designed to kill your quantum computation? And I think that that's a very important direction for research. But, you know, we've learned several things since then. Uh, you know, first of all, we've learned that even if there are correlations in the noise, you know, as long as the correlations are small enough, like they fall off with distance, for example, then error correction should still work. But now the other thing is that, you know, if you could really just design the noise with any correlations you want, you know, and with complete advanced knowledge of which quantum computation is going to be applied. So like you're a, you're a demon, basically a quantum computer killing demon. Then, you know, at that point, such a demon could also kill classical computation. And, and, and yet our classical computers work. Right. So we seem to have some evidence that nature is not, you know, malicious in that way. So Gil Kalai, the mathematician and one of the most prominent skeptics of quantum computing, so he keeps putting forward models of noise that, that to me are like that. They strike me as, as a conspiracy theory, you know, on the part of nature. Yeah. Usually, right? usually physicists yeah. are willing to assume that nature is not. <laughs> No, yes, oh. yes, exactly, 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 right. Gill just sort of starts from the assumption that nature has to be killing quantum computing, and then he works backwards to sort of, well, then what could be true about the noise that would, you know, that would cause that to be true. But to me, you know, the, the fact that someone is as smart as Gill has, has not gotten any further, you know, in, you know, or has, has had such limited success in, in showing how, you know, any natural noise model would do that is actually evidence for the opposite of his position. Yeah, I'm, cer I'm right? certainly nowhere near as worried about it as he is. That's what I'm yeah, 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 yeah. No, but, but, but I, mean, I, could, I could say something more, which is that the quantum supremacy experiments of the past couple of years have actually uh, directly addressed some of these worries. So one of the, the, the most interesting things scientifically from Google's uh, quantum supremacy experiment a couple of years ago is that they found that the amount of signal that they could sort of extract, you know, by measuring their qubits, basically just went like the fidelity of each gate that they applied raised to the power of the number of gates. So just like the simplest, most naive thing possible, right? Basically, they, they saw the errors acting in a very uncorrelated way. Yeah, that's a good sign. Yeah. yeah. So Scott, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. So we've been going for over an hour and 20 minutes and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Maybe we could close with your thoughts. I read, I think your recent blog post on DeepMind's alpha code. Oh yeah. And it made me, uh, it reminded me cause I thought most of our conversation would be about quantum computing, but it reminded me that you're a person whose opinion on AGI, I would really like to hear. And for example, whether recent progress has changed your priors or, or what, what your prediction is for human level AGI. Yeah. Well, I, I think that my opinion has changed over the last decade. I mean, I've been as astounded by the, uh, successes of, of deep learning as, as anyone else, basically, I had not predicted that, you know, we would see this sort of just pure, uh, machine learning model that, that you, you tell it nothing about the game of go, you know, besides the rules, and then you just have it play against itself you know, 
millions of times, just completely ignoring all of the centuries of human expertise about how to play Go. And then it will just completely destroy all humans at, at playing Go, or for that matter, any other two-player game of perfect information, you know, uh, just about that, that anyone can think to design. And that the same approaches will work for voice recognition. They will work for translating text between languages. And now uh, they'll work for generating programs that meet some specifications, right? You know, I've been writing my blog since uh, 2005 or so. And, you know, so I was aware that, you know, on the, the sort of nerd blogosphere, there were a lot of people worried about the prospects for AI taking over the world, right? And I interacted, you know, even, you know, 15 years ago with, with Robin Hansen, with Eliezer Yudkowsky, who were writing about these topics. And, you know, I think I was, I was mostly skeptical at that time. I didn't deny that it was possible in, in principle, but it just seemed like solving the problem of, you know, intelligence is going to be, you know, this log of who knows how many centuries or, or millennia to unravel this mystery. And that was partly informed by my own experience, you know, having studied AI as an undergrad and as a beginning grad student, you know, seeing just how enormous the gap often was between the hype and the reality and just how little, you know, these systems really understood or just how brittle they were you know, to making slight changes to uh, what kind of question you were asking them. But now what the world has learned over the last decade or so is that if you just take the ideas that were already around in the, you know, 70s and 80s, just, you know, neural networks, back propagation, now it's been rebranded as deep learning, right? But, you know, that's, that's what it is, right? And maybe there have been a few, you know, new ideas since then, you know, you have GANs, you have, you know, reinforcement learning, you have convolutional neural nets, but mostly you just scale it up to networks with billions of, of neurons, which of course people couldn't do back in the eighties. And you train them on these enormous amounts of data that you now have because of the internet. And then suddenly it works. It goes from not working to, to working. We still don't have a full theoretical understanding of why it works. Okay. And, you know, there are many people who would, you know, uh, I have many colleagues who still kind of uh, poo poo it. Right. And they say, okay, but these systems don't really understand anything. You know, they're just pattern matching. It's just statistics. They're just regurgitating what you already told them. And they, they sort of seize on any evidence that maybe they're not working so well. Like, you know, there's this whole subfield where you look for what are called adversarial examples, where like, if you know enough about how a neural network works, then you can design, you know, a picture of, you know, a pig that it will classify as a chicken or something like that. Right. You know, but then I, I look at that and I say, well, who is to say that if someone had the wiring diagram of my brain, that they couldn't design an adversarial example against me? Oh, humans have, humans have been inventing adversarial tricks forever. Guess. What are, what are, right. What are, what are, what are optical illusions, but a sort of adversarial example uh, against us. So I think that, that the oath that we swear when we, you know, become scientists, right. Is that like, if reality tries as hard as it can to teach us a certain lesson that, you know, we will learn the lesson rather than inventing clever reasons, you know, to maintain our previous worldview. Right. And, and I think that we do have to update on this, you know, remarkable success that these methods have shown. Now, you know, having said that, you know, we don't know where it's going to go, right? You know, I, I, I am still doubtful that you could take, you know, let's say GPT-3, which is the text engine, and that you're just going to scale it up to, you know, a few orders of magnitude, more neurons, and then suddenly it's going to have desires and intentions and it's going to rebel against its creators and take over the world, right? I don't think that that's going to happen, right? You know, I think that, you know, more likely it will just become better and better at sort of babbling, right? You know, and what it does is, you know, I think it is now, it has solved the problem of like generating essays that like could get a B or a C in an undergraduate class. 
it can sort of act like it knows about any topic, you know, even though, you know, on a close reading, uh, really it doesn't. That is impressive in a way that an AI is able to do that. The thing that should make people nervous is that, is that no one really knows, you know, if there is a hard barrier between that and just completely solving the problem of, of intelligence, right? There might be a hard barrier or it might just be that, that, you know, you need a few new tricks, maybe a lot more scaling to, you know, bigger and bigger GPU clusters. And then what we are doing, what our brains are doing is just, you know, some kind of pattern recognition that is fundamentally a lot like this. The people I mentioned before, like, you know, I'm, I'm Eliezer Yudkowsky, right? You know, he has been famous for, for decades for, for arguing that the biggest task facing humanity right now is to ensure that when AI does, you know, reach the level of super intelligence, when it sur starts surpassing us in intelligence, that it is aligned with our values, that it will sort of create a utopia for us rather than, you know, wiping us out, maybe harvesting us for energy, like in the Matrix movie <laughs> you know, or whatever, right? And, you know, I, I'm still, well, you know, I, I guess if you look at how I voted with my feet, you know, I, I am not spending my time working on that. I'm still, you know, working on quantum computing and, and other things that are, you know, I interesting to me, right? You know, part of my difficulty is well, even if I agreed in principle that, you know, this is something that, that people should worry about, like, I'm still not sure what should be done about it as a practical matter. Well, right. I, it, yeah. I suspect that AI safety may be an unsolvable problem. I mean, it may be that mm. even for yeah. us to predict the behavior of something superior to us may be not possible and therefore to design it to guarantee safety could be quite difficult or maybe impossible. Yeah, that is possible. I mean, you know, Eliezer would say, well, we have to try because, you know, that's our only hope as a species. Yeah, I think it's fair. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I would also say that, you know, just, just looking at the world today, you know, problems caused by stupidity, you know, by just greed and idiocy and sort of known flaws of humans are so severe that, you know, may, maybe I would try my luck with super intelligence, you know, <laughs> maybe it doesn't seem so bad by comparison. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, an argument I often make to these folks is that, you know, probably this, the first few of these things are going to be very human like. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the intelligence they develop will be through looking at examples that mm -hmm. came from humanity. And, and, you know, even if they get rid of us, maybe by accident without <laughs> noticing, they're still kind of like us. So they're like our, you know, evolutionary descendants and good yeah. luck to them in the rest of the universe. Right? Uh, so. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I think that that is what they would say. They would, you know, saying, well, well, you know, maybe to the extent that humanity will still exist, it will be because, you know, we have uploaded ourselves or something, or we will have a very different form than yeah. what we have now. But, you know, we want to make sure that whatever world is, is created that way. It's, it's a world that, that we want, or, you know, that, that we are happy to have created. And I mean, yes, the way that I would think about it is that like, I hope that our civilization survives long enough for these to be, you know, the most urgent problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it might be the day wipes us out before, uh, before we actually get the going. Yeah, like, like there's so many mundane things. I mean, from, you know, climate change to, you know, to pandemics, as we're now suffering through, to nuclear proliferation, that I feel like if we can survive all of those things to the point where, where AI becomes sort of the most pressing concern, then, you know, we will have done, you know, we will have done pretty well, right? Yes. There, there's a uh, science fiction novel called Void Star. I don't know if you've ever... I haven't, I haven't. Zachary Mason, who's actually trained okay. in computer science. He has a PhD hmm. in computer science. And mm -hmm. in Void Star, you know, there's a job category in the future called AI Wrangler. Hmm. And because it turns out the AIs who live mostly in this, vir they're, they're first created in this virtual world, they're not interested in most things that humans are interested in. They're out trying to figure out whether P equals NP and doing all kinds of things in their own virtual worlds that they, that to them are real. And so they immediately escape and they're living, you know, in this massive worldwide network. And these mm -hmm. AI wranglers try to get them interested to solve some, you know, material science problem or some mundane, how do we make our batteries better? Stuff, stuff that corporations care about. Uh -huh. And mostly they just don't care about us. They're just doing their own thing in their own virtual universe. So, yep. 
Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's true that, you know, almost all of the science fiction that there's been about AI has just shown a sort of a staggering lack of imagination, right? Yep. You know, either they're, you know, robot butlers or they're like, you know, enslavers, uh, like in the Matrix movie, but that can somehow be defeated by kickboxing them. You see, right? from, from my perspective, Scott, you're, yeah. you're a superhuman intelligence, but you seem to spend most of your time on benign pursuits, like figuring out whether P equals NP, right? So maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Well, or, or just or just answering comments on my blog. Yeah. Or just dealing dealing with my kids when they're you know acting up no i, I am uh, i mean i mean look i i you know look at you know at ed witten or at terry tao and i say you know these are super intelligences right and i you know because i am not that you know maybe i can better contribute just by by writing about science or by you know writing a blog by uh you know, doing doing the various other things I do. No, I I, I don't think of myself that way. Yes, I, I was I was kidding a little bit, but I just had, I just meant that the, the AIs the AIs might have abstract yeah. pursuits that we we can't understand. Sure, sure. No, I mean I, I mean it's also possible that you know they, you know they would just within the first few seconds of turning them, the, of us turning them on, they would solve P versus NP and the Riemann hypothesis and. Uh, you know, all of that other stuff. And then they would go on to, I don't know, just, you know, um, um, abstract art, you know. Telling, telling stories to each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So something, some, something that we can't even imagine right now. <laughs>